Alright, peace. What it is. Finna. I'm just gonna read. You know, I don't even have to do nothing else. I'm just gonna read. So, I'm gonna start with chapter two. The book ain't nothing but a hundred pages. And when I get done, I'm gonna show you all these references. But I'm just gonna read this. Just want you to read. Just, you just need to hear it. You know, and I never else to say. So here we go. The history and teachings of Elijah Muhammad. The disruption of ancient civilization of the Near East and sudden arrival of white people in the vicinity of the Caucasus, Mount, Caucasus Mountains, what took place 2,000 years later when they rushed out of the hills and invaded civilization are among historical events presented in the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. One of the significant features of, of, of Muhammad's teaching is his bold and unique approach when it comes to clarifying some of the unexplainable aspects of these events. For instance, Elijah Muhammad said 6,000 years, years ago a new race of people showed up in the region of the Near East. The new race, Muhammad says, were white people. Remember what I remember? We already know white. Right? The brother who wrote it, you know, his conscious level is where it is. So that's why we're reading it like this. But we know what that means. He says that the whites first appeared 6,000 years ago on the island of Pelan in the uh, again, 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 I can't pronounce that word, where they had been made uh, by a process of selective breeding called grafting cloning. According to Muhammad, it was black people living on the island of Pelan who gave birth to these whites. Under their leader, Yaqub, the blacks of Pelan were placed under a system of law by which marriage was based on skin color and which only the lighter complected babies were allowed to survive. Muhammad teaches that over the course of many generations the population of Pilan began to grow lighter and lighter until after 600 years of grafting the people became very pale and white when some of the whites from Pilan showed up in the near east their presence created calamity as a result they were driven out away from people into the hills of west asia there muhammad teaches they remain for 2000 years for the next 2000 years Following the driving away of the whites, they became isolated and cut off without proper guidance and things to start a civilization of their own. As a result, Elijah Muhammad explains, they slipped into a life of savagery. He says that 2,000 years later, he says that 2,000 years later, you served civilization from the original people. Since history shows that my son would be back there going in. Shows that the, a disruption had occurred in the Near East just prior to a sudden appearance of the whites in the hills of West Asia. It is possible that the teaching of Elijah Muhammad are indeed rooted in fact. Or is it possible, he's saying. In so much as not in so much as no other reasonable explanation has been presented to explain these occurrences, since the evidence is consistent with what Muhammad says took place, it is reasonable to suggest that what Muhammad teaches is in fact true. Traditional accounts used in the study of ancient history. Listen to this. This is important. What are... Hold on. One second. What are traditional accounts and how are they used in the study of ancient history? Traditional accounts are studies or narratives that in ancient times had been used to explain important historical events, which are passed down from one generation to another. Up until the turn of the century, traditional accounts were often viewed as meaningless tales without any real historical value, but today's historians recognize that such accounts can be very helpful in bettering our understanding of the past. Modernly, traditional accounts often help explain the manners, customs of people, as well as the time and place in which they originated. The use of ancient tradition accounts in the study of history has led to some surprising, surprising discoveries. And now he's going to explain how this dude discovered an ancient city based on an uh, ancient story of Troy or whatever. Ancient, so, you know, you're going to leave it on Ancient. Uh, a, search, a search for similarities. Ancient narratives that purport to describe a series of actual events are historically useful when it can be shown that they point to real places and events. Whether they do or not is determined by the number of similarities that exist between the words of the account and the actual places or events themselves. The most popularly known tradition account which shares similarities with the teachings of Elijah Muhammad is the Bible story uh-oh, of Adam and Eve. According to the Old Testament, Adam was made 6,000 years ago. This date is arrived, arrived at by adding the ages of all the patriarchs from Adam to Abraham as they appear in the 5th and 11th chapters of the book of Genesis. 
Accordingly, the time of Adam's creation corresponds with the time of Muhammad. Muhammad says white people first appeared on the planet. In addition, the Bible's record of the making of subsequent driving away of Adam and Eve from the garden fits perfectly into the time frame established for the sudden arrival of Caucasians in the hills of West Asia. In this, in his book, Messenger to the Black Man, Elijah Muhammad explains that the Bible account of Adam and Eve is in actuality a narrative of the early history of the Caucasian race. Mm. Could the story of Adam and Eve be, be an accounting of early history of Caucasian people? What are the facts in this regard? A review of traditions of the making of man as they exist around the world showed the surprising number of them to be in the full agreement with Muhammad. They relate they relate that Adam and Eve had white complexions, some depicting new the new man male starting out with a darker complexion and then later being transformed into white. One such account has been handed down the tradition of the Mandu Indians and the record of making a man. Whew. The Mandu point out that in the beginning, God made two people out of dark red clay. But one one day after a garden was planted, and those same people turned very white. Not only in the Mandu Mendi account similar to, the, not only is the Mendi account similar to the Bible story of Adam and Eve, but it also offers information supportive of the position that first white people were somehow transformed out of early darker skinned people. In his book, Folklore in the Old Testament, George G. Frazier quotes that quotes the Mandy account regarding God's making of man as preserved in Mandu, Mandu tradition. Frazier writes, one day he took dark red earth, mixed it with water, and fashioned two figures, one of them man and the other woman. The next morning, he thrust a piece of pitch wood into the ground, and fire burst out. The two people were very white. No one today... It's so white as they were. Whew. The similar tradition from India explains that the first Caucasians were made when a group of dark-skinned people gave birth to light-complected light babies, who in turn gave birth to a nation of albinos and from whom other whites were born. Dr. J. Davey mentions this tradition and considers the possibility of the white race having originated in this manner. According to accounts of the island of Ceylon, Silent. As to the likelihood that whites first came to existence through the means similar to this, Dr. Davy admits it is easy to conceive that an accidental variety of the kind might propagate and that the white race of mankind sprung from such an accidental variety. Mm. The East Indians are of this opinion and they and there is a tradition or story among them in which this origin is assigned to us. See, this cat talking about himself. Mm. This view, the views of scientists like Dr. Dave, Dr. Davey and others concerning the origin of the white race generally are in accord with Muhammad's teaching and that most agree that white people have had to come into being by way of darker skinned parents. This much as at least was admitted by L. Bulk. Who I need to sit up yet. Who in an article entitled... The origin of racial characteristics in man wrote white skin started from an ancestor with black skin and whose offspring hair and iris were suppressed more and more. That description matches perfectly with what Elijah Muhammad referred to as grafting. Listen, when Charles Darwin discussed the origins of race, he too expressed the opinion that selective, excuse me, selection over the course of many generations had to have been used. And bringing about what he called the characteristic differences between the races of man. He knew. He even went on to conclude that without some of form of some form of selective breed. This is very important. He even went and concluded that without some forms of selective breeding, such racial differences simply cannot be accounted for in a satisfactory manner. Darwin Darwin's findings that new races were formed by Continue, continuing to marry offspring who share similar physical characteristics is consistent with Muhammad's explanation of the grafting process. Damn, that was difficult. The reason why it was difficult because I was trying to explain that. I mean, I wanted to explain that dominant recessive DNA. Once we mix with them, we, we, we wipe them out like that. You know what I'm saying? You know, if you half and half, you're a nigga. You know how that is. So that's what he's saying. It has to be some kind of selective breeding to even create them. Because if we would have just kept mixing with them like that, they would have just been a part of us. Like, you know what I'm saying? So, James, <clears throat> excuse me, Cal, 
Charles Picard, the British anthropologist, looked at the facts and concluded that the physical differences between the races of man can only have resulted from a method comparable to the process of artificial selection carried on by plant and animal breeders. Uh-oh. This, too, is consistent with the words of Elijah Muhammad. You know, you don't think that reading would take so much out of you. Okay. When it comes to answering the question of where all this selective breeding could have taken place, Dr. Ed, Edwin Grant Co Coakland, a professor of biology at the Princeton University, pointed out that geographic isolation, similar to the kind that Muhammad said occurred on the island of Pelan, definitely played a role in the formative stages of race in his book, The Evolution of Man. Dr. Conklin wrote, It is evident that the distinct races could not have been established and perpetuated except by the aid of isolation, chiefly, ge chiefly geographical. What does all of this mean? Only that experts agree that some form of grafting had to have taken place, had to have taken, excuse me, place. Uh -huh. However, they have been unable to identify exactly where it took place and who was in charge of it. They know who, they just don't want to tell you. Whew. Thus, it is with good reason that when asked whether a new race could pr produce by separating Pacific individuals who possess similar genetic traits and selectively breeding or grafting them over the course of several generations as taught by Elijah Muhammad. The experts have to agree with Dr. Rum, who, I, who admitted, by scientific breeding, we can shuffle these genes with their characteristics and breed traits in or breed them out. The laws of heredity plus the principles of separation and selection operating over a period of time will produce various races of the world. So Elijah Muhammad teaching that the white race came into being as a result of a form of selective breeding is not all at all unreasonable. This is why it is so easy for Dr. David to consider the earliest East Indian tradition that described birth of white people from dark skinned people. Hold on. Alright. I had to stand up, man. It's hard to sit down and read. Another ancient tradition accounts that shares Another traditional account that shares similarities with the teachings of Muhammad is the biblical account of Jacob, Jacob's grafted flock. Genesis thirty thirty five says Jacob, the English translation name Yakub, was able to produce unusually colored flocks of sheep and goat through the use of a skillful breeding technique. According to the Bible, it took Jacob six years to successfully change the color of the flock. That the Bible stories of Jacob's grafting flock is related to the birth of white people from black parents. It's attested in the ancient book of Jewish tradition called Midrash Rab, Rehit, Rabba. Midrash Rabba. There, a discussion is recorded between the black king of Arabia and the Jewish scholar Akabi, At, huh, huh, Akaba, Akaba. In that, in that discussion, the black king is said to have stated... I am black, my wife is black, yet we gave birth to a white son, to which Akiba response was, if you are surprised that such a possibility studied the case of our father Jacob's flock, which were influenced by their complexion by the rods. In Akiba's response, he drew a connection between the birth of white-skinned child to black parents with the case of Jacob or Yakub graphing or graphing of unusually colored flock. That it took Jacob six years to graph his flock parallels with Muhammad's history of Yakub. Moreover, the name Akiba, like Jacob, is also a variant of the name Yakub. So, so the idea that whites originated from black people is by no means a new idea. Uh, in an article entitled Metallurgy, Anthropology in Hesodic and Plato. Has sold, has sold in Plato. Robert Esler traces the origins of the four races back to the teachings of the black Nubians and their allies, the Phoenicians. You already know. Esler, Esler, excuse me. Esler reports that during the time of the black Nubian rule in Egypt, the Phoenicians were busy circulating a call to all pale skinned nations demanding that they lay down their arms and submit to the rules of the blacks. According to Isla, the blacks then were 
of the view that pale skin whites represented successive stages of degeneration from the aboriginal perfection of the Nubian golden race high down. That ain't even this author's words. That's from, what is that from? Robert Eichler. Go look him up. Fuck it. This, again, is simply another way of saying that the original people were black and that all other races came from that original group. And Eichler also correctly pointed out that also the real meaning behind the Greek stories which speak of the golden age. Writing towards the end of the period, historians call Greek the Greek Dark Age, the three or four hundred years following the Dorian invasion, the ancient po poet Hesold acknowledges that there was once a golden race, all good things. Hesold writes was, were theirs. The faithful earth poured forth her fruits, unbidden in boundless plenty. Big wordy ass. Anyway, <laughs> peaceful KEs. They kept their lands with good abundance, rich in flocks, dear to the immortals. Mm. The golden race were the blacks. The golden age was the period before the arrival of your boy. Okay. In the Chalice and the Blade, yes, Eastler states, an earlier time when humans led more harmonious lives is also a re reoccurring theme in the legends of Mesopotamia. Here there are repeated reference to a time of plenty and peace, a time before the great flood, flood when women and men lived in an idyllic garden, in an idyllic garden. Though there are the stories from which biblical scholars now believe the Old Testament myth of the Garden of Eden in part derives. Hinting that the story of Adam and Eve actually outlines the disruption of civilization. Isla writes on Isla went on to write, Likewise, the Garden of Eden and Fall from Paradise myths in a part draw from actual historical events. These stories reflect the cataclysms, cultural changes, and imposition of male dominance in the accompanying shift from peace and partnership to dominance and strife. This we know now talks about the arrival of the white man. What does all of this mean? Only that the facts of history are consistent with the teachings of Elijah Muhammad. And that those teachings are also supported by the findings of anthrop anthropologists as well by numerous traditional accounts of various parts of the world. Real history. Symbolically told. Many of the traditions of the ancient Near East tell the events and circumstances identical in every way to those taught by Elijah Muhammad. Viewed individually, it is easy to attribute such similarities to coincidence, but when collectively examined, the ancient accounts present a pattern so overwhelmingly consistent with the teachings of Muhammad that they leave no doubt as to the certainty of their meaning. My son keeps interrupting me. A number of accounts are included in this category. Each of them tell of the birth of a white-skinned child whose arrival signals the beginning of trouble and chaos and who ends up being driven away from the people and taken into the remote locations of the high Caucasus Mountains. Historically, such accounts narrate the birth and arrival of a new race of people, disruptions which follow, and the driving away of the new race into the hills of Asia. Such are details that appear in the history of ancient Persia. This shit. The history of ancient Persia is outlined in the national epic called Shan Shanana. This ancient account relates to the event in which two dark-skinned parents gave birth to a white-skinned son. The boy father was terrified of usual in color, and the child is immediately announced to the people as his newly arrived son belonged to a race of devils. Soon thereafter, a group of men from among the elders of the city issue a warning concerning the white, child, the white child's future. Turning toward the father of the boy, the elders declared, this will, this will be to the production of nothing but calamity goddamn as in the story of adam and Eve, a decision was made to remove the child from the region in the words of the shamana the white-skinned boy was stripped bare and removed from the land and abandoned in some remote place far from the association with man thus the child was seized and taken to mount albers in the heart of the Caucasus mountains there the boy was abandoned isolated and alone he grew up naked without shelter God damn. Another tradition recorded in the Book of Enoch, y'all can find that, also fits this familiar pattern of states that Lamech's wife gave birth to a white-skinned son 
Lamech's white skinned son likewise ends up in the Caucasus Mountains on Mount Arik. And that's where they say um, Noah's boat landed too, Mount Arik. Arik, Arik, whatever. According to the versions, uh, version book, according to the version found in the book of Enoch, Lamech's the boy's father describes a child as changed, unlike and different and of a different nature than those who had lived before him. As in the other accounts, the newly arrived child's skin is said to have been white as snow. His hair was blonde. The book of Enoch talks about what happened when Lekmash learned that his wife had given birth to an uncommonly colored child. You know what? I think you get uh, you know I'm gonna finish this on this last page. She she became pregnant by him, brought forth a child, the flesh of which was white as snow, red as a rose, the hair of whose head was white and long. <laughs> like man, his father was afraid of him flying away to his own father, Methuselah, and said, I have begotten a son, a chain son. He is not human, he's mankind. But he is a different nature from ours, being altogether unlike us. Here the circumstances surrounding the birth of white skin of the white skin child symbolically represented the arrival of the new white skin race of people into the region of the Near East. Lack makes father, Methuselah, not knowing what to make of the unusual boy when seeking the advice of his own father, Enoch. Thus, Methuselah went to Enoch and said, A child has been born whose nature is not like the nature of man. His color is whiter than snow. He is redder than a rose. His hair is the head whiter than white. And behold, I have come to thee, that thou mightest point me out, point out to me the truth. Methuselah's last statement suggests that there to be a hidden meaning and symbolic pur purpose associated with the birth of this child. That the child birth only an allegory signaling the beginning of some important historical event. Whew. Hold on. That is a horrible reading, but I had some water. Anyway. Uh, what is saying? Following through the answer, the Lord will affect the new. The Lord will affect a new thing upon this earth. So the words, a new thing upon this earth, forewarned, forewarned that a change was about to take place following the arrival of the white-skinned child. Moreover, Enoch's words indicate the arrival of the child would bring about a change that would affect the whole world. That it would alter the course of civilization. This is this is much the same as what Elijah Muhammad says happened in the Near East six thousand years ago, and the facts bear him out. In the Bible, similar change occurs when the arrival of Adam and his subsequent expulsion from the garden. The Holy Quran also states just before the making of Adam, the angels warned that Adam's arrival would only create mischief and cause the shedding of blood. The night down. The nature that warn that warning is similar in many ways to the one issued by the elders of the Shamana. And they and the prophetic words of Methuselah to Enoch. In each example, the phrase is calamity, a new thing, mischief, the shedding of blood, accurately described the disturbance that swept through the ancient societies of the Near East and upset the course of civilization six thousand years ago. Are these accounts really historical narratives to the events that occurred long ago? Let's take a closer look. It's some of the accounts beginning with the Bible story of Adam and Eve. Alright. Now, let's get to these references. I'm going to try I'm gonna put these on here. I'm going to try to go Google some of that shit. I already, I already got like, well, just really just one. That uh, Adam and Eve book I showed on the white thing. That is crazy. It really just talks about how they was in the cave and how they kept killing themselves because they, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it ain't, I, I mean, I don't know. It's funny, but I guess it ain't, it shouldn't be. But it is, I don't know. It, it's just funny because it wasn't taught, you know? And now I know why. Now I know why they put so much mystery behind all this. Because if you knew their history, we wouldn't look at them the same. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I think it would be better. I'm just showing all these references. My brother got a hundred plus references <laughs> to support. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, some of them are the same repeated, but you know, we can easily say forty different <laughs> references, maybe fifty. And this is hidden knowledge. You know, this ain't stuff that just. Look at this. 
the book is only a hundred pages. So I'm I mean not much of it is really his opinion. He's just kinda linking stuff together. You know. So uh yeah man, go check these books out. You know, message to the black man, you know, I, I ain't even never read that. I ain't gonna start. You know what I mean? Because I know Elijah Muhammad was Elijah Poole Bay. <laughs> but you know, of course, wisdom is wisdom. But anyway, y'all get it. Peace.